Thank you, Trevor. Appreciate it. And welcome to all of you here today. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, at our event. Um, I'm going to be talking about Internet of Things and wearable technologies and the many policy issues surrounding them. As Trevor mentioned, we've uh, got some testimony that I delivered uh, in the Senate recently that's in the packets in front of you. Um, I also uh, put together a ridiculously boring 118-page law review article on these issues called Internet of Things and Wearable Technology, Addressing Privacy and Security Concerns Without Derailing Innovation. For those of you who can uh, bear the punishment of reading through that, that gives you all the more detailed approach, uh, issues that I'm going to address here today. So what I'm going to do in this presentation is I'm going to walk through um, the various types of explanations of what the Internet of Things entails. Um, talk about some of the economic potential or opportunities associated with the IoT and wearable tech. Uh, I'll do uh, a more deeper dive into some of the technical and social policy issues related to these technologies and some of the issues that you may be addressing up here or we might be seeing regulatory agencies address. And then I'll also uh, talk about some potential constructive solutions including non-regulatory solutions to some of these problems. And if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the importance of thinking about adaptation in this debate to new technologies. I want to stress that uh, I try to make my presentations as interactive as possible. I encourage you to interrupt at any moment if you have a question or if you'd like to make a quick comment. Um, but I'm going to try to get through all of this and say about 25 to 30 minutes so we have plenty of time for discussion. So with that, let me start and begin by talking a little bit about um, definitions and talking about the many different ways we conceptualize of this thing we call the Internet of Things. We hear a lot of different definitions of the term today. Some of the most popular ones uh, include things like industrial internet or internet of everything. These are terms that uh, GE and Cisco use a lot. The traditional academic term or technical term for technology in this space has been machine to machine communication. I've even heard really corny things like fingernet and fingerverse, and God help us if we start using that to describe this. I hope that doesn't catch on. But really, whenever you hear the term smart as a modifier for any new technology, it really is the Internet of Things we're talking about, whether it's smart homes or smart cars, smart buildings, you know, smart devices, smart mobility. That's really the IoT. That's the Internet of Things. What's the best definition? Well, I like this one from Morrison and uh, uh, Foster, or Forster. Um, the IoT is the network of everyday physical objects which surrounds us, increasingly being embedded, which te uh, with technology you enable these objects to collect and transmit data about their use and surroundings. Um, more generally, or more simply rather, it's really just the IoT is a world where the internet and connectivity is baked into all the stuff that we own or come into contact with. Um, what powers the IoT or what makes it unique or special? We're talking about obviously devices that are embedded with not just microprocessors but also sensors and wireless connectivity and have the ability to connect with cloud storage usually or some sort of cloud devices or networks and then have very ubiquitous types of big data, data collection capabilities. What's really important about the IoT that a lot of people overlook is its miniaturization of everything that really matters here. Everything in the IoT space is getting smaller and smaller. It's been easier and easier because of cost factors to embed these sorts of technological capabilities in all of our devices today where that was just not possible a generation ago. And really what this means is that the long awaited and, and much desired sort of seamless web of connectivity that we've always talked about in the world of the internet uh, and cyberspace is now coming true for better or for worse. Of course, that's what we're going to talk about today, some of the concerns about it as well. So how connected is the connected IoT world? Well, here are just a few estimates. Uh, I've got a survey that I've done with one of my colleagues, uh, Andrea Castillo at, at Mercatus Center, uh, of the projections on connectivity and economic benefits associated with IoT. If you want all that data, it's in that report from Mercatus. We'd be happy to get to you or you can find it on our website. We're talking about potentially 35 to 40 billion devices by 2019, according to ABI and Cisco. Really high-end projections can go as high as 212 billion. I think that's probably a little too high, but regardless, we're talking about a lot of connected devices. Here's a look uh, depicting sort of like IoT relative to other types of technologies such as tablets and smartphones, and you can see where, relative to where we're at right now, pretty astonishing growth coming in, in, in future years. And of course, some of these things like wearables and, and cars, you're talking about really just a subset of the IoT, so you could layer a lot of these things together to get a picture of that growth. What about the economic opportunity associated with the Internet of Things? Well, it too is significant. Here are some projections from McKinsey and IDC and Cisco. 
Um, 3.9 to 11 trillion from McKinsey, 8.9 trillion from IDC, 14.4 trillion from Cisco. So a lower bound of almost 4 trillion, upper bound of getting closer to 15 trillion. That's a, these are big numbers, of course. We're talking about the equivalent of the economies of some small countries, just from the Internet of Things. Here's some pictures, uh, here's some a depiction of some uh, projections, rather, from various companies that I just mentioned going from uh, present day up to about 2019. There's so many different players in this space. Every, every time I see a snapshot of major players in the Internet of Things landscape, the names and, and, and logos change. Uh, this is one uh, I saw recently uh, of the different types of layers of the IoT. Obviously, I can't sit here and identify all those different companies for you, but there's so many different types of companies and players in this ecosystem. And, and of course, you could break each one of these down, the quantified self, world of connected home, lifestyles, industrial internet, and really explode this and have so many other players in each of these sectors. The number of developers that are getting involved in this space, people doing the actual coding and actually creating a lot of IoT applications, growing quite rapidly. We're seeing that go up uh, just as fast as the overall uh, Internet of Things growth that I talked about a moment ago. Probably the most interesting category to me and the one that's going to drive a lot of policy is the wearables market. And the wearable sector is really just Internet of Things devices that are right now worn on the body in some ways or that we interact with. The so-called quantified self movement growing quite rapidly. Um, you know, you think about things like Google Glass as well and other types of devices like that. There's even the idea of sensor-rich fabric that will have the Internet of Things literally sewn right into our clothing in the future. I don't know how many of you watched uh, the US Open or Wimbledon this year, but there were actually tests with like Ralph Lauren and other companies fitting the ball boys on the courts with wearable sensor-based uh, fitness shirts to monitor their activities. Pretty soon all athletes will wear them, and pretty soon and after that we'll be wearing devices like that as our clothing. We won't even notice it. And also these devices could become sort of the equivalent of lifestyle remotes. We'll be able to, just as we talk to our Siri today on our Apple phones or other types of devices and tell them what to do, pretty soon you'll just be able to tell everything in your life exactly what you want done. People call that lifestyle remote. The wearable space, again, incredibly diverse. You can't see all of this, but the, the major subsectors of just the wearable space are things like safety, uh, security, medical, wellness, sports and fitness, lifestyle, um, communication, and glamour. Each one of these growing quite rapidly, which is why I suggest keeping your eye on the, on the wearable space, because it is really, really huge. Um, right now, obviously, everybody who's wearing a Fitbit or a Jawbone has sort of a, a first-generation IoT device on them. Um, and these are making a real difference in a lot of people's lives. And when I wore one two years ago, I managed to lose 30 pounds in a matter of a month and a half. So, you know, amazing things can happen with these devices. Other professional sectors uh, and jobs, however, will be transformed radically by the rise of the Internet of Things. These are just a few. I can't get into details about all of them, but of course, we're already uh, hearing about things like body cameras for police officers. That's really an IoT device when you think about it. Think about all the types of surgery and telemedicine that will be improved or, or changed because of IoT devices and wearable technology. Theme parks, right now Disney has the magic band that you get before you even take your kids down to Disney. It's a band you put on your wrist and it starts monitoring what you do or what you engage with in terms of Disney products. When you go to the park, it can specialize or personalize your experience based upon your tastes or your child's tastes. And then various other sectors, retailing, entertainment, so on and so forth. You can imagine how IoT will come into play, especially with wearable tech. In health, it's really important to start thinking about how this is going to play out. This is a, tax, a topology of like all the different types of wearable fitness devices or mobile health technologies that are already out there that do things like monitor your, your wellness or that can help you uh, administer your, your drugs that you might need uh, if you're suffering from an ailment or just more routinely, like I already mentioned, track and log your daily activity for fitness purposes. This is a really huge area, and obviously the FDA and other agencies getting involved in, in monitoring this. So that's just some idea of the growth of the wearable sector, 700% growth um, in the second half of 2013 alone, uh, and the number of units shipped here is astonishing. Every major player in the tech world seems to have some sort of a, a wearable tech play now in the marketplace, from Google to Apple to Microsoft to Samsung, you name it, especially now we have the rise of smart watches and everything else. Now the really crazy sci-fi future of wearables comes in with stuff like implantables or ingestibles or embeddables. 
This is when the world of the IoT or wearables is essentially inside your body. We're implanting it or swallowing it. This is pill cam. This is a pill you can swallow right now. Uh, instead of having a colonops colonoscopy, you can basically take a pill that will go through your colon and tell you how you're doing. It's a lot better than the alternative. Trust me on this one. Um, and then the really freaky world of biohacking's out there that I wish I could talk about but don't have time to do today, which is all the things people are already doing voluntarily to their own bodies to implant sort of enhance, enhance, enhancing capabilities in themselves. People are implanting cellular devices in their skulls so that they can get their phone calls right into their ear with cochlear implants and with bone conduction, you know, your bones ring in your head. People put magnets in their fingers to have special types of control over things that are magnetic. There's a whole website devoted to people doing this to themselves with some videos that you do not want to watch while you're eating lunch, trust me. Um, so that's the world of IoT going into our bodies, and pretty soon that will be a reality. Okay, so it's an exciting new world. It's obviously going to raise some pretty touchy issues in terms of public policy, however. Now, there's really two ways to divide the policy issues, I think, two crude ways, into sort of technical versus social concerns. The technical concerns, which I'm not going to spend as much time on today, are pertinent and will obviously be debated here in the halls of Congress and in agencies in coming months and years. They have to do with things like, where are we going to get enough wireless spectrum to accommodate all these devices that are going to be connected to the internet and connected to each other? What about technical standards? Will we have, you know, sort of interoperability among the different platforms and then the different technologies or technical standards that are out there? Who sets those standards? And then there's questions like device addressing. How do we keep track of all these devices on the internet? So many different devices. Um, so these are sort of technical issues. Um, I want to stress that this is not the focus of most of my papers or this presentation, but it's clearly an important set of issues. I'm also, however, optimistic that we'll solve a lot of those problems, that we're actually going to find ways to make these devices interoperable and to set common, uh, common sense standards for them um, and get IP addressing done correctly and things like that. I'm a little less optimistic we're going to have a smooth transition when it comes to the social concerns about these issues. We're talking about security, privacy, safety, and then either even broader sort of fears about what automation means to our lives, to our jobs, to our humanity even. Really profound philosophical questions about it. Is it the cyborgization of humanity, you know, when we're all wearing devices all over our bodies. Um, I'm not going to focus on that here today. You can probably just watch some Star Trek episodes and you know, uh, or some uh, dystopian sci-fi movies and probably get a taste for what other people think about that. But this set of issues right now is really driving policy in Washington and across the world, I think. Really, uh, privacy and security being a, a real uh, focus here. And concerns about where your, all that data goes that's being collected, who's handling it, how's it being used in particular. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that right now. But who are the agencies or who are the, the, the policymakers who are interested in this? Well, obviously, pretty much any agency with an F in the title seems to be interested in some way, shape, or form um, with IoT today. But really, you have to look at what the FTC has been doing, I think, on privacy and security for uh, these devices and these systems, which is important. But obviously, if you're talking about wearable health-related devices, the FDA is already looking into this, providing industry guidance on some of these things. FCC is looking into the technical issues. If you consider commercial drones part of IoT, which maybe, maybe not, that's the FAA. Connected car technology and the question of things like car hacking, NHTSA is looking into that. You got the NTIA, who in the administration is investigating like privacy issues from a multi-stakeholder perspective. Here in Congress, there has not been a lot of legislation yet, but I know a lot of, uh, a lot of different committees are getting very actively interested. There has been some Legislation floated on particular concerns, such as car hacking. Uh, Senators Markey and Blumenthal have a bill on that, for example. And then there's a lot of interest at the state and local level in the U.S., but even more internationally, especially in the European Union, because of the way that these technologies are really starting to shake up things like the privacy directive and the data directive, rather, over there, and the question of data handling uh, in the EU, which is treated much differently than here in the U.S. So let's do a deeper dive on privacy and security because I think this is probably what's going to end up occupying a lot of your time uh, as you go forward with IoT issues here in Congress. And what is it that creates the special sensitivity about the IoT relative to the traditional Internet? Because we've already had privacy and security concerns about the Internet, right? Well, again, it's, it's the sheer volume of all the data being generated. It's all of these devices connected, connected to us and collecting data full time. 
These devices are always on, always sensing, always collecting, always communicating. Essentially, the Internet of Things can be thought of as sort of a, a giant data generator and a giant data vacuum cleaner at the same time. It's creating all these new data flows, or what some people call a data exhaust off of each of us. And then it's also sucking it up, collecting it, putting it somewhere else for use at a later time. So in the world of privacy and security, especially in privacy, we talk a lot about fair information privacy uh, uh, practice principles, rather. Um, and these are sort of principles about how data should be handled. And they're very, very difficult to imagine how this is going to be enforced in the traditional sense for this new emerging space of Internet of Things and wearable tech. Federal Trade Commission Chairwoman Ramirez said the difficulties will be exponentially greater with the advent of the Internet of Things as boundaries between the virtual and physical worlds disappear. It harder she means to enforce these ideas of the so-called FIPS or Fair Information Practice Principles. What are those principles? Well, things like what is adequate notice in a world where things are always on, always sensing? How do we tell somebody like, hey, I'm recording everything you're doing right now through my little lapel camera or through my little device that I carry in my pocket or whatever else? What counts as consent? If I'm walking down the road with something like Google Glass on my head, do I have to, and I'm filming in real time, do I have to ask everybody, do you consent, do you consent, do you consent, do you consent, do you it's just not going to work, right? That model probably is going to be strained by the rise of the IoT. Transparency is another one of these so-called FIPS principles. But how do you make things transparent or even provide something as simple as a privacy policy, like you do it on your website, how do you do that for an IoT device when it's so small and you're not even reading anything before you start utilizing it? What's respect for context, which is another principle saying like when we collect data, you're careful about how you use it in certain contexts. Well, how do you count that when all that data is being collected for so, potentially, for so many potential purposes down the road that we don't even know of yet? And then there's a principle of data minimization about we should only collect what's really needed, like as much and as necessary for like whatever purpose. But that's not the way these devices work. They just collect as much information as possible and then later sort of mash it up with something else and come up with some interesting application or something for you. So all of these traditional fair information practice principles are strained because of the rise of wearable tech and the IoT. It also challenges many spe specific sectoral laws or regulations that are on the books. Whether we're talking about HIPAA privacy principles or the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, COPPA, or FERPA, which have to do with educational privacy, um, Graham Leach Bliley financial privacy regulations. There's a whole patchwork of state and local privacy and data security laws already on the books. There's FDA safety standards about you know, class one, class two, class three devices, um, which are going to be really strained by the IoT and wearable tech. And then there's even some workplace issues about what you can do in a workplace. For example, there's questions about uh, not just what kind of data you can collect about your employees, but things like what kind of things you can even film or do inside of a workplace, which are really going to be interesting when you, everybody's got little you know, cameras all over their bodies and your buttons of your clothes or whatever else. Um, what can you film in your own uh, workplace? So one suggestion that a lot of academics have and a lot of companies are starting to suggest is that instead of trying to apply the old privacy principles or practice, uh, fair information practices, we start moving to a world of so-called use-based restrictions for the Internet of Things and wearable tech. We start thinking about maybe saying, okay, we can't possibly stop all this data from being collected by all our different devices. But maybe what we can do is we can carve out specific types of uses or applications that we just say are verboten. We just don't want to go there because they might be sort of so discriminatory in nature or they might just raise a sensitivity about I don't know, your finances or your health or something like that. So there's a very real sense that this is like one of the solutions we'll start to see a move towards, a movement away from traditional sort of notice and consent and notice and choice kind of models for privacy and security, and maybe towards one that just says, thou shall not for X, Y, and Z. But then almost everything else goes. I want to stress that there's a raging debate in the ivory tower world about this idea about moving from notice and choice to use space restrictions. Some people say, if we're going to do that, fine, but we've got to keep notice and choice anyway, even if it's strained by the rise of the IoT. There is also a problem of if you move too far with carving out too many uses of these technologies or this data as saying you can't do it you know, with a use space restriction, that you get at the problem of privacy paternalism. We are sort of imposing your point of view, either as a policymaker or as an academic, on everybody saying, well, I'm not comfortable with this data being collected about my health. 
Other people might say, we want more data collected about our health from our wearables. Whenever I used to be on the Fitbit side I was on, people complained most about their Fitbit not collecting enough data so that they could track more of their activity. And yet when I talked to privacy, a lot of privacy activist friends, they would say, our Fitbits and other wearable devices collect way too informa much information about us. I said, hmm, that's interesting, right? There's a real clash there of values about privacy. There's a small point I want to raise here, not spend much time dwelling on this, but if we move to like use-based restrictions for IoT, there's also a question about First Amendment issues in this country. Because when we're wearing wearable devices and we're recording with them, not just recording video, recording audio and recording data flows around us, there's a legitimate question if we have a First Amendment right to do so. And in public places, traditionally, you have had that right utilizing previous forms of technology, such as cameras or handheld recorders or just your laptop or a notepad. You can make notes. You can observe the world around you. So this is going to be a very interesting tension in the United States relative to Europe, which, of course, does not have a First Amendment like we do. It basically leans heavily in favor of privacy trumping free speech and data collection. But here we balance these things out, right? We try to strike some reasonable balance about collection of data versus use of data. But generally speaking, we lean in favor of free speech and letting people collect information. But in a world where that's so unbelievably easy, what are the limits of that relative to the First Amendment? It's an interesting question to remain for the future. OK, let's talk about some solutions. Um, because Obviously, there are going to be regulatory proposals put on the table. There already are many being put on the table by academics and advocates. In my own work, I'm trying to be as objective as I possibly can here, uh, but I'm, I'm also going to try to inject a few of my own thoughts on this because in my own work, I've tried to suggest that maybe we can come up with some bottom-up approaches or consider alternative solutions before we rush to sort of try to regulate the IoT and wearable tech. And what we're going to need is a so-called layered approach or a multifaceted approach that incorporates a whole host of solutions, some of which I've suggested here. Be beginning with the idea that developers themselves will need to take these issues seriously and should be encouraged by policymakers, as they currently are by the Federal Trade Commission and others, to bake in good best practices about data handling and about privacy, so-called privacy by design or security by design. I can get into more of that in more detail if you'd like. On the consumer side, we need a whole heck of a lot more educational efforts in this country for both adults and children when it comes to proper device usage and sort of the idea of media literacy or technological literacy. We don't do much to educate our kids about these things and they sort of learn it on the fly. Um, I don't know, most of you look pretty young, you probably don't have teenage kids like me, but I'm in, I'm in an active uh, fight every day with my kids about sort of educating them about proper uses of technology and improper uses. And it's usually the improper stuff that I'm talking about the most a Snapchat and Instagram and other technologies. So this educational role happens at many levels, the parental level, family level, school level, maybe even a governmental level. Our government can encourage these things uh, or put them into the classroom. The third thing of social norms and social pressure, I'm going to get to more in a second about the kind of pressures that the third party groups can put on people for how they use technologies. Um, think about the fact when you go into a gym, it's frowned upon the idea of pulling out your camera and just like walking around, right? Because it's, you know, for, for your phone, because it looks like you've got your camera and you're filming, right? My gym even says, no cell, no cell phones in the locker room. That's a social norm. It's a social sanction. Or you go to a restaurant or you go to a movie c cinema and your device is on or it rings or whatever else, people will get a little angry. They might shush you or something else, right? So in the world of IoT devices, I think you're going to see a lot more of that social pressure, social norming being part of the solution. However, we're going to need more than that, and I think you're going to see more than that come about in the courts. I think we're going to have a lot of, uh, in the future, we're going to have a lot of these issues tested in various cases and controversies that will arise about the misuse of IoT technologies. And we're going to see things like the privacy torts uh, utilized to address some of them, or even things like we have peeping Tom laws about surreptitious filming of people when they're not aware of it. But we also have torts such as intrusion upon seclusion that say you can't just walk into somebody's house and start filming them or do whatever else. So right now, that would be pretty obvious I was doing it. But in the future, I might have a wearable device of some sort that's surreptitiously filming and recording things. And I might later use it against it, somebody, and then they can come and sue me under these kinds of principles. We might also need to rely on product liability or strict liability uh, or negligence uh, principles that come up in other uh, contexts. Um, the Federal Trade Commission also plays a hugely important role here, as do state uh, attorneys general, in terms of enforcing unfair and deceptive practices 
The Federal Trade Commission's already engaged in this, as I'm going to mention in just a sec second. So that may be something. And then there might need to be, as I suggested just a moment ago, some targeted laws addressing specific uses of specific types of information that are collected by IoT or wearable technologies. And that's especially true for very sensitive classes of information. We already have carve-outs in American law for things like financial privacy, for health privacy, and children's privacy. Those are likely to continue, may even be expanded. Um, I already mentioned developer side solutions, but when I get into best practices, and if you want to talk about it more, these are some of the principles that companies need to be following when they think about data handling utilizing IoT technologies. This first one's particularly important about doing their best to sort of encrypt, fully encrypt and then to, to anonymize a lot of this data. Um, but there also needs to be um, some use guidelines put upon like who can handle that data, how it's stored, how long it's kept, who can access it, maybe how long before it's deleted, what other purposes should it be utilized for. This is a raging debate, however, because most companies want to collect as much information as they can and then see later what they can do with it to create a good business model. Most privacy advocates and security advocates say, you ought to be deleting that regularly. Every six months, you know, purge it. Eh, you know, how do you balance that out? What's the sort of Goldilocks formula for getting it just right? I don't know, but that's a raging debate that will continue. Better transparency is also a part of that. Um, I won't get back into consumer education. I already talked about it. Uh, liability norms. Here's what the FTC is doing. The FTC is already going after some of the biggest names in the tech world for various types of privacy and security lapses. I think this is going to continue. I'm all right with this, generally speaking, although some cases can go a bit, a bit too far. But uh, this is an old number. I think there are now over 60 data security related cases at the Federal Trade Commission. Again, some very big names here, including really onerous types of forms of 20 year privacy audits being imposed on companies. And basically what's happening here is a lot of companies make promises to the public or to the consumers saying we won't use your data to do this or we'll hold on to your data and keep it secure in this way. And then they don't. They break that promise. The Federal Trade Commission comes in and says that's an unfair and deceptive practice. The important point here is that we already have the equivalent of law in the books to deal with IoT and with internet security and privacy. Some people don't think it's enough, but this is pretty impressive. They've gone after all these folks, and it's so much so that some academics speak of an FTC common law of cases that is developed around privacy and security. They have so many cases now that they say this essentially sends a message to other smaller developers that says, be careful about how you handle data. Be careful what you use your technologies to do. Now let me say a word about social adaptation before I wrap up because I've written quite a bit about this question of like how we humans adapt to new technologies that come in and disrupt traditional social or economic norms. I find the process really intriguing. And I've gone back and done a lot of historical work just looking at how we adapted to other technologies in the past. It almost always follows this sort of a cycle of a sort of initial resistance to new technology. Sometimes there's even a sort of a techno panic phase, like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do about this or that? But then there's sort of gradual adaptation. People start becoming more familiar with it. They see it in public. They maybe buy it. And they're like, OK, I, I can see why this is useful and not so bad. And then there's just eventual assimilation. And we're like, huh, ho hum, it's just another technology in our lives. We've seen that cycle play out again and again and again. And the reason I stress this is because we're right now in a phase with IoT where we're very uncertain. And we're looking at a lot of the uses of these technologies or data and we're saying, ooh, that's creepy. I don't like that. But we said the same thing about countless other technologies throughout history. My favorite example is the camera itself. That's an old primitive camera if you don't recognize it. And the reaction of the camera in the late 1800s is really instructive because it was far, far more disruptive than today's technologies if you think about it. So much so that Judge Brandeis, before he was a judge, wrote what is probably the most famous law review article on privacy issues in American history with Samuel Warren, a famous intellectual from Boston. Um, and it was called The Law of Privacy. And it basically said, they, they, they said, instantaneous photographs and newspaper enterprise have invaded the sacred precincts of private and domestic life, and numerous mechanical devices threaten to make good the prediction that what is whispered in the closet shall be proclaimed from the housetops. <laughs> there was sort of terror about the camera, right? But we got through it. Instead of all wringing our hands endlessly about what we we're going to do about the camera, we went out and bought one, right? It became a sort of unique part of the American you know, experience. We all sort of expected cameras to be in our lives. And so I'm not saying there's no problems with cameras. There were problems with cameras back then. There are problems with cameras now. Samuel Warren was mad because someone from the Boston Globe had the audacity to come take pictures outside of his daughter's wedding in a public space. 
Today we'd be like, eh, it's public space. You know, you're gonna have a wedding in public? People are going to take pictures outside, right? But we still have problems with paparazzi, right? We still have problems with peeping toms and people going under bleachers to try to take pictures, you know, at, at gyms or whatever. I mean, there are creeps out there that use cameras for bad things. We have targeted laws to address them. But we didn't think we've got to ban the camera. We've got to, we've got to, I mean, Brandeis and Warren in this article actually wanted to sort of have a carve out from the First Amendment to deal with photography. So thank God we didn't go that far, right? But we still found a way to narrow the focus to the real harm associated with cameras. But we assimilated them into our lives gradually. And we have norms about cameras. I just mentioned one about in gin locker rooms, right? That's a different way to sort of regulate camera use. If anybody pulls out a, ca a camera in my gym locker room, I'm like, what the hell, you know, you don't do that. That's not cool, right? So that's a different way of regulating the use and improper use of technology. I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the IoT and wearable space over time. Anyway, here are the key takeaways I hope you pull out of this talk, which is that really when you think about these debates about security and privacy, there's never any end point in these debates. There's a sort of constant evolutionary challenges associated with like defining our privacy and security and coming up with uh, constructive solutions. We've already seen this in the first generation of sort of the, the internet and, and the web, but there are no simple silver bullet solutions to any of these problems. I hope nobody ever uh, uh, you know, tries to you know, make you think that there are because I've seen this happen again and again and again in technology policy debates. Like if we just had this, we could solve that problem. If we just have, for example, mandatory age verification, we won't have any problems with social networks and bad actors on them. Mm, probably not going to happen. There are still going to be bad actors. You know, you just can't have simple solutions to complex problems. You need layered, multifaceted solutions. You need creative ways to fi figure out how to solve these things. Um, I think the reason this is particularly important, and I'll leave you with this, is because the IoT is interacting with so many other technologies that you're going to come into contact with in coming years here in Congress. The debate about robotics is really just beginning. The debate about 3D printing is starting to get underway in a big way. We already have raging debates about various types of health policy issues. The important point is, is that the IoT plays into all of these. Because when we live in a world of connected technologies and devices, we're going to have these issues come up as we have more robotic technologies in our lives, like obviously smart cars, or drones, or artificial intelligence, or augmented intelligence devices that we, we have in our lives. The health devices that I already talked about, all the things that we're going to wear on our bodies to try to keep track of our, our health or our fitness. And in the world of 3D printing, we're going to be manufacturing, self-manufacturing in our own homes, many of these technologies. So all of these issues play together. There's a huge fight in, the, in, in this space about them. I, I've written about it in my book. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but it comes down to this idea of, do we embrace the idea of permissionless innovation, or do we take a precautionary approach? The permissionless innovation idea is just the general principle of freedom to experiment and learn through trial and error. It's what's driven the internet and all the online innovation we've seen over the past 20 years in this country. There is a different approach. We could take a precautionary approach that says, well, you know, the, the, whoever creates a new innovation has to first prove to the world and to maybe to policymakers that it will never bring about any risk of harm. And that's driven a lot of what's happened in Europe with data handling. I'd like to suggest that we have, some, we have some real world results about this experiment, and it hasn't played out to Europe's advantage. All of America's tech leading tech companies are household names, not just here, but across the world and in Europe. Meanwhile, it's very difficult to even name any major tech innovators in Europe. Part of the reason is because they took a very highly precautionary approach to policy, especially to privacy and security, whereas we took a more permissive one and said, no, let's wait and see what happens. Doesn't mean there's not going to be any harms or no problems. We will have to address them. But where we set our policy default matters profoundly. That's why I'll leave it with this picture, which is that this choice between permissionless innovation versus precaution has many different, you know, top-down versus bottom-up ramifications. But I think my preference would be to start these debates about the Internet of Things and wearable tech from a perspective of permissionless innovation, figure out can we adapt or can we use a sort of resiliency-based approach utilizing bottom-up solutions such as education, digital literacy, better transparency, industry self-regulation, best practices, privacy and security by design, and then move towards these things as we need them. But don't start here. Don't start with the idea that we need to stop this technology. We need to prohibit it. 
And even here we should be cautious about administrative regulation or licensing restrictions or various types of sort of mother may I approaches to the Internet of Things. Start with the bottom up solutions, work in that direction would be my, my preferred approach. Anyway, I've gone on too long. I'll leave it at that. We've got a lot of materials in our, in our packet, a lot of other materials on the Mercatus site for you to read on this issue. And I'd be happy to take any questions you have at this time. Thank you.